The stock market in 2023 had one of its best years. If we take a look here at the S&P 500, you can see that it went up by more than 26%. Very few people expected it to happen, and many were expecting there to be a recession in the US, here in the UK, and across lots of other countries in the world. And now, as we head into 2024, we have lots of the same people calling for a stock market crash because they think the S&P 500 is just way too overvalued. So what's the truth behind all these claims? What data are they using? And finally, what should we do as investors if what they're saying ends up happening? Let's work through each of these one by one and see if anything holds up. Okay, first up, here's one of the biggest arguments. The stock market's gains have come from just a small number of stocks, and the S&P 500 is now way too concentrated in the hands of a few companies. Both of these statements are true, and here's the data to back it up. Take a look here, firstly, on where the gains of 2023 actually came from. This graph from JP Morgan's latest stock market report shows us that the top 10 stocks in the index returned 86% of the gains, which means that the rest of the 490 companies only contributed 14%. Not so great then for anyone holding stocks outside of the top 10, which includes the famous Magnificent Seven, the likes of Apple, Google, Amazon, Tesla, and Meta. And what about the second claim that the stock market is now way too concentrated in just a few big companies? Well, this is also true if you look at the same report. As of the end of 2023, the biggest 10 stocks made up more than 32% of the entire index. This is the biggest share of the index that has ever been seen by the top companies, and it's not really a surprise when you look at the size of them. Consider the fact that you now have five companies worth over a trillion dollars, and then 10 of them with values more than $500 billion. For some perspective, the entire FTSE 100 here in the UK, which is made up from the largest UK listed companies, is only worth around $2.5 trillion. And you can cover that with either just Apple or Microsoft on its own. Pretty crazy. What this now means is that the stock market, and more importantly the US market, is heavily reliant on just a few massive companies doing very well. And for anyone invested into index funds, like me and many of you guys out there, this means that if any of these companies don't do very well, this can have a big impact on our returns. When a company like Apple or Microsoft lose value, this now has a huge impact on the whole market. But more importantly, think about all the people invested into this index either directly or through their pensions. Tens of millions, maybe even hundreds of millions of people are relying on these massive companies to continue to do very well where in the past, things were a bit more spread out across more businesses. Now, just on this point, what's the key takeaways for us? Well, it is true that the S&P 500 at least is very concentrated in a few big names, and we're at highs never seen before. But the only way to know if this is a good or a bad thing is to know how these companies end up performing in the future. Do they continue to grow and live up to their high prices, or are they overpriced? We know that more and more money is flowing into them from index fund investors like you and me without thinking about it. So is this causing more and more of a bubble to form? I think there's definitely a strong argument here to suggest that the S&P 500 is overvalued. And I can see why a lot of people might think that a high concentration is a bad thing, as this means there's a lot more risk spread across fewer companies. But, and here's the really important thing, there's no way to know if this is a good or a bad thing unless we know the future. What if the companies have an amazing next five or 10 years as the AI race takes off, and these companies are the ones to deliver? The valuations might look high from a historical standpoint, but this is irrelevant if their best growth is still ahead of them. So in short, I'm not convinced this is some kind of magic argument to stop investing, but it is worth at least being aware of. One way to get around some of this huge concentration would be to consider investing globally, rather than just in the S&P 500. I did a whole video on this one that you might want to take a look at afterwards. Now this leads us on to the next argument that I've seen being made over YouTube and other places covering the stock market. The price of the S&P 500 is just way too high, especially if you look at the PE ratio over a long period. We're now just too rich. On screen now is a long-term chart across the last 50 years showing something called the Schiller PE ratio. We don't need to get too technical and dive into what that means, but it's widely regarded as a measure of how cheap or expensive the stock market looks. On the 50-year chart, you can see that right now we're at 32. And over the long term, that does look very high. It's certainly not at all-time highs, which we saw back during the dot-com era. And we're still a bit away from the recent highs seen at the end of 2021. But clearly, we're way ahead of the very long-term averages, which are closer to half this amount, depending on whether you use the median or the mean average. 
Now, some of the videos I've seen will reference this or the regular PE ratio and say that this means the stock market is almost two times more expensive than it should be. So therefore, the market needs to fall by 50% to justify these current prices. But is this analysis just too basic? And are they just saying this for the clicks to scare people who end up being much new investors? Well, also have a look at this before we come to any kind of conclusion on this point. Going back to the JP Morgan report, we're reminded that throughout history, a high PE ratio has typically led to lower returns over the next five years. There's two graphs here. This one on the left shows us the returns are after a year and on the right, after five years. Basically, it shows us the relationship between the PE ratio and future returns. If the stock market has a high PE ratio when you invest, typically, the longer term returns have been lower. Not much of a surprise really, as it's hard to sustain a really high PE ratio unless all of the companies are growing as fast as they would be expected. Now, this might seem like a solid argument and make you not want to invest right now. The problem is that this assumes that you're investing at just one point in time. This return is only based on you putting all of your money in at once and never investing again. If you were someone who invests regularly, something like every month or as you get paid, your returns would not look like this and you're buying in at all kinds of different prices. In fact, in a stock market crash, your buying prices just get cheaper and cheaper. And as a long-term investor, this is exactly what you want. Otherwise, you can't benefit when the market eventually gets back to all new time highs. Also, just before we move on to the final point, it's worth saying that any kind of analysis like this can only ever look backwards. And unfortunately, this is not that useful when we're trying to invest for the long run and want to look forwards. Sure, the PE ratios look high when you compare them to the past 20, 30, or even 50 years ago. But the world and the companies inside it were very different. You can't compare a fast growing technology company to a slow growing oil company, for example. One will make way more profits than the other, have way better margins, and be able to sell their products all around the world without much increase in costs. Of course, you'd expect a company like Microsoft or Amazon to have a high PE when compared to oil and energy companies, which used to dominate the stock market just a couple of decades ago. The companies of today's index are totally different from the ones in the past. So using past data is not a very good tool to try and suggest whether something is or isn't overvalued. Since the creation of the internet and lots of modern technology, there is almost no way you can compare an older stock market to the modern one as they look totally different. Just quickly, if we go back to the Schiller PE ratio again and change the chart to 10 years, for example, now does the stock market really look overvalued? I'll leave that one for you to decide. Really, it all depends on perspective. Now, final point that I've seen people use to justify why they're selling everything or just not investing right now. The stock market has had a really good year, so therefore there's no way it can just have another one. So I'm waiting for a crash, they say. I think this point is all tied back to our psychology as investors, but more on that in a second. First, is it true that if the stock market does well in one year, it's less likely to do well in the next one? Well, not that I can see. Here's some data I pulled from Ben Carlson's blog, A Wealth of Common Sense. Here's a selection of good years in the stock market showing what has happened in the years directly after it. Ben's point here is that the good years have tended to cluster together, if anything, rather than be one-off events. You can pick any section as an example, but how about just looking here at 2012 to 2014? During this time, you might have thought after a 32% increase in the stock market, there was no way you could get another double digit year, but this is exactly what happened. Also, the same thing happened in the run-up to the dot-com bubble. Probably not the best example as that didn't end well, but the point is that there's no way to know what the stock market will do from one year to the next. A strong year does not mean a bad year has to follow, and likewise, a bad year does not mean that a good year has to follow, or even another bad one in a row. There is absolutely no way of knowing. Unfortunately, all this does is highlight how bad our psychology is when it comes to investing. Our little chimp brains might be great at telling us when to eat or drink to keep us alive, but they're rubbish at trying to think long term, especially when it comes to investing. We look for patterns to try and predict the future, and we also base our decisions on things that have happened more recently to us than something that have happened in the past. There's a whole video I could do on the mental side of investing, and I've mentioned loads in my previous videos. But the only takeaway you need to ask yourself is, what do you actually do with all of this information and arguments that you see online and in the media? Do you sell everything if you've been investing for the last five years because the market is probably going to go down? Do you not even start investing because the S&P 500 has just hit a new all-time high and has to crash? Then a follow-up would be, well, if you don't want to invest now, what's the magic signal that tells you when you should invest? And if you do have the answer to that question, 
please leave it in the comments section alongside the lottery numbers for this week's Euro Millions. Trust me, there's always one. I actually need to screenshot more people for a wall of shame because it always amazes me how many people have such strong opinions on the bearish side. I'd love to know what they invest in. Anyway, put this all to one side, what do we do? Well, for me personally, this has to come back to what you want as an investor. I'm a long-term investor and I want to invest to build my wealth for the next few decades. I know that it's gonna be a really bumpy ride with lots of ups and downs. I also know that if I stay invested and keep investing regularly, I increase my chances of doing well because there's never been a period in history where investing for 20 years has lost you money. Even saying that though, let's assume the worst. What if we are headed for a crash or poor returns over the next few years? What can we do about it? Well, the answer for me is nothing. When I invest and when you invest with a long-term horizon, you have to treat that money as if you'll never touch it again. You have to fight that urge all the time to sell everything out of fear or the opposite situation where you go all in at one point because you're afraid to miss out. There will always be times in the market when things seem uncertain, but this is the price you have to pay if you want those long-term returns. And also, going back to all of the channels and people who keep calling for a crash, their answer tends to be that you should somehow trust them to find the stocks which will perform amazingly well. If anything, what this video should show you is that a tiny number of stocks are the only ones that provide the vast majority of gains, and this makes them extremely hard to find. Everyone is hunting for the next Tesla, but good luck finding it. If there was a reliable method to buy and find stocks that can always beat the market, this method would become useless because everyone would follow it. You could make the same argument about index funds and passive investing, something that I strongly believe in. But we are nowhere near the point where you could even make the argument that index fund investing is saturated. Again, if this was the case, it would make the active investor's life so much easier because they could just find the undervalued stocks really simply, right? Good luck with that. For now, I'm sticking with the plan long term and continue to invest every month and whenever else I can to contribute to my accounts. If you also want to get started investing, I do keep all the links in the description below to the platforms that I use where you can get some free shares or free cash when you sign up and deposit. So is the S&P 500 overvalued? I have no idea. Honestly, I'm not convinced by any of the arguments and although they might be useful if you were a trader or trying to time the market in the short term, as a long-term investor, this is all just the usual noise. If stocks go down, I'll be buying the same if stocks go up. That only applies when you're buying the whole market though. Who knows whether an individual stock is overpriced or not? That's for you and the rest of the market to decide. Anyway, what do you think? Let me know in the comment section below. See you in the next video and as always, Happy investing.